We want to welcome you to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. As you get settled, a few housekeeping reminders. Please use the Q&A section for any questions today and remember to be constructive in any of those questions or comments to the presenters and to one another to ensure that we have a session that is productive. Also, AIA California will submit one AIA HSW learning unit for those who complete this session live. And as always, the webinar content and additional resources will be available online shortly after the session. Today's webinar is focused on factory-based construction and qualifies for one AIA HSW learning unit for those who watch live. AIA California staff will report those units for you once you have finished the entire session. Now to quickly introduce our speakers. Brian Smith is a professor and director of the School of Architecture at the University of Arizona. Professor Smith has been teaching, researching, and consulting with respect to offsite construction, industrialized building, prefabricated and volumetric modular production, product R&D, factory setup and layout, design assist, and market analysis and surveys for 20 years. Tyler Schmetterer is a sustainable prefabrication entrepreneur, thought leader based in Switzerland and New York with 30 plus years of created creative business strategy, international marketing, business development, partnership development, project management, communications, and consulting experience. Tyler currently serves on multiple international advisory boards in the high performance building, renewable energy, and sustainable impact capital sectors. Now on today's pr presentation, Ryan, please take it away. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Appreciate it. And I uh, want to also say thank you to Frank Ostrom for uh, inviting us to make this presentation. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, is that coming up okay, everyone? Yep, great. Today is modular and offsite construction, the role of the architect. Um, this is prepared for uh, AIA California, this audience. Uh, uh, if you weren't aware, also AIA Spokane is joining. This is part of their Architecture Month Climate Conscious Design. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Tyler Schmetter. Uh, I'll present first, and then he'll present towards the end. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Arizona, as was described. I'm also the director of the school there, um, myself being an architect. Tyler is a developer and entrepreneur, uh, has worked in the space for some time. Uh, so we're pleased to uh, present this content. We run a, an advisory group called Mod X, uh, which is helping those within and outside the sector uh, learn about and advance industrialized housing. Um, so to, we're pleased today to be able to present this content. We'll start out with talking about some of the drivers, and then we'll move into some of the terminology and get into what we see is a, an evolving role of the architect in this new uh, offsite construction or modular construction practice. Uh, Tyler will then share um, uh, an in-depth uh, case study of his experience in delivering these projects. So what does project delivery look like for offsite and modular construction using what we call a modular team approach and trying to identify what the change in role of the architect is in, in that landscape. Let's start here. Uh, this is 2017 McKinsey's study uh, that built off of some prior research at Stanford. And what it did is try to identify what the problem is in construction and therefore what the drivers are for utilizing offsite construction. Um, this is what McKinsey called the de deindustrialization of the construction sector from 1964 forward. And if you compare it to other all, all other non-farm industries, what you see is that construction ranks the lowest. It is the winner of, of uh, lack of productivity or declining productivity. That means for every unit of labor or money that's put into that sector, we get less out of it today than we did in 1964. Uh, some would argue that that's because buildings are more complicated or complex now than they were before, that's true, um, or that there's more regulatory pro processes that limit innovation and the ad advancements of productivity. Uh, and yet we look at other sectors that have had similar regulatory frames or similar constraints or complexity imbued within them, such as shipbuilding, aerospace, and other industries, but have seemed to be able to leverage technology and manufacturing in a way to increase the productivity of those sectors. 
So McKinsey said there's lots of things that one could do to increase productivity within uh, the construction sector, uh, i.e. leveraging technology. Uh, one in particular that we're going to be talking about today is how to rethink design, what the role of the architect is in realizing greater productivity within uh, industrialized construction processes or offsite or modular construction processes. Um, so first, we'll start with some categorizations of offsite construction systems. Um, if we look at this chart, uh, we think it's quite helpful in describing what, what ModX calls a degree of enhancement versus degree of pre-assembly. So on the y-axis, you have a degree of enhancement. That means the level at which that prefabricated element is enhanced, uh, i.e. Uh, uh, insulation, pre-wiring, linings, cladding, interior finishing, and whatever is done you know, off-site within a factory environment. And as you go from um, the bottom, uh, 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 as you go from the bottom to the top here, or a uh, zero to, to you know, um, uh, vertical, you will see uh, an increased level of enhancement. On the x-axis, the degree of pre-assembly describes going from something that is like a 2D or 1D element all to a 2D element, to a 3D element, to a completed structure. So one might describe coming out of the factory here at the upper right corner would be considered a HUD code home, a manufactured home. And even though um, you know, in architectural circles, it's not considered architecture, from a manufacturing standpoint, that is a, that is a product. That is a product that is completely finished out of the factory. Somewhere in here, we have the dash line. We call these closed construction sections. These are sections that are not inspectable on the job site and therefore are inspected in the factory. Um, and so the inspection process for offsite construction is a little more complex. But today we're talking primarily about these 2D and 3D pre-finished systems in the factory brought to the job site and assembled to make single family and multifamily housing. Uh, industrialized construction is a funny word, and we're going to talk about terminology here because it can mean both things that are industrialized on the job site as well as things that are industrialized in the factory. Industrialized construction uh, here in production housing is absolutely uh, using um, productivity, incre increasing productivity by virtue of industrialized principles. Um, just laid out on the so job site. You could call this you know, a factory on the job site. And production house builders, in many ways, have perfected this. It's they've teased out a lot of the inefficiencies in delivering single-family detached homes uh, just through the job site optimization. That happened in the middle of the 20th century uh, through things like the Lustron um, effort um, and Lustron homes uh, and other developments that uh, were able to use uh, mass production methods on the job site. Uh, those things can be brought into the factory and, uh, and imbued within uh, increasing productivity by industrializing the factory operations for housing production. So here we see open panel construction. There's also closed panel construction. Open panel would be a framed wall panel that has nothing um, finishing on the outside. It might be layered with an OSB sheet. So you've seen these. It's like a panelizer, right, that would produce these. Closed panel or enhanced panel is then to take that panel and add more um, value to it, such as insulating the walls, pre-wiring, or even finishing that panel. Those are then stacked on the back of a truck vertically and shipped out to the job site. If they are not closed panels, but open panels, they're usually stacked horizontally like flat pack, and then they're uh, um, erected into place. <clears throat> so here's an example of a closed panel manufacturer that then uses them within the factory to produce a volumetric modular um, 3D boxes. So uh, here on the assembly line, you can see pre-inserting -inser of windows. Uh, I always find it fascinating. Here, the uh, encapsulation of the window with the framing, as opposed to building the framing and then putting in the window. That's to get a tight fit between the window and the framing. And then those walls are um, you know, made into uh, a framing wall, here they're insulated with mineral wool, insulation, uh, gypsum board, uh, stacked and finished in drying racks on uh, a, a, a drying vent, and then put into 3D boxes and, and go down the line as such and, and finished. Uh, this is a factory in Sweden. It produces nine boxes a day, for example, for multifamily housing. Uh, Volumetric modular is an extension of the 2D panel, open or closed, and there's two major distinctions to be aware of. Here on the left is manufactured homes. That's under a different code uh, than we standard as usually use as architects, right? That's the HUD code. So 
uh, that's nearly 100% complete. The, the uniqueness of that or the differentiation is that the platform or the steel chassis with, uh, with the wheels stays with the unit through the entire life of that box. They're being known as single wides or double wides. Um, and then on the right, you can see uh, modular construction is different in that it uh, does not uh, get linked to its chassis through its life. It is a standalone uh, structural, stu structurally uh, uh, stable box that is um, uh, to the IRC designed and built to the IRC or IBC code. They're usually 50 to 80% complete in the factory um, and usually platform frame. 70% plus of manufacturers uh, are making this for light wood frame. There's also light cage steel and hot rolled steel uh, boxes as well. Volumetric modular can be stacked horizontally or vertically. One distinguishing feature is that you have a ceiling plane as well as a floor plane. So there is a doubling up of structure at the wall and, and the um, ceiling to floor. That can increase uh, 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 floor to floor heights in multifamily housing um, that uh, can cause some difficulties uh, with zoning laws that have limitations on heights um, and therefore uh, you know, could potentially remove an entire floor from the top. So uh, zoning ad, uh, advocates for modular are trying to change uh, zoning ordinances like has been done in Oakland to allow for if it's modular to go uh, a slightly higher. Uh, this is a standard manufacturing process for volumetric modular in which the 2D elements are built, uh, made into the box as it goes down the line. The important thing to note here is uh, these factories that were used for HUD code or manufactured homes are now being used uh, for uh, a much more sophisticated product, an IRC or IBC code product. And therefore, um, uh, a lot of the logics of manufactured housing is trans being transferred over to volumetric modular. Uh, this, this is an opportunity for leveraging the principles of manufacturing. However, it also brings uh, over uh, maybe some bad habits in the way in which uh, HUD code homes are made into mo volumetric modular that have to be um, Checked have to have to have QAQC and uh, involves architects greatly in ensuring that the quality uh, of the product is imbued in the product. Um, but note that uh, that that we don't have a lot of um, closed panel manufacturers here in the United States, and that's because we leapfrog in, in many ways our prefabrication industry for housing and went directly from HUD code housing to volumetric modular. And the factories were were um, tra transitioned over as multifamily housing increased in the last major recession. Um, uh, we will start to see, we believe, more and more. Uh, open panel manufacturers or even uh, volumetric modular manufacturers moving to the closed panel business in the future. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about project delivery. And one of the uh, things to note is that uh, in traditional offsite construction delivery, uh, what we see is an approach in which the designer, the architect, is located here. Uh, with in uh, variable stakeholders, so that you as the architect may come in and out of projects, but all of these stakeholders are going to be variable in a standard delivery process. So a custom designed multifamily housing project, for example, uh, may use a design for manufacture and assembly uh, process. So you're using principles of thinking about how this is going to be manufactured and built, but ultimately this is a one-off project in traditional delivery in the U.S., for modular construction, meaning that every project is really a prototype manufacturer. It's not true manufacturing because it's a one-off. Just be like doing a pilot project or some sort of prototype before one goes to mass production. Uh, this limits some of the advantages of using manufacturing principles and continuous improvement of a product that could be used in multiple projects. And so today we're, uh, we're going to be presenting something in which we, we think has great uh, opportunity within the US context for leveraging manufacturing principles and rethinking design as it relates to offsite and modular construction. That's something called modularized product platforms. So to rethink design in offsite construction, rethink the role of the architect, one has to uh, start to consider how this is approached in other industries, in other manufacturing industries. It starts to become much more like product design or industrial design as opposed to thinking uh, it, it solely as an, arch an architect traditionally might. Uh, what is a modularized product platform and how would one uh, leverage this for a digitalization, industrialization, and ultimately circularity 
of the economy and the ecosystem to reuse some of the elements of um, of uh, offsite construction in future projects, thinking you know 100 years into the future. This is the real opportunity for leveraging modularized product platforms. So what is it? Modularization is the activity of dividing a product or a system into modules that are flexible so as to create different requested configurations while reducing the number of unique building blocks or variants. So by reusing the module variants across multiple reconfigurations or multiple projects, you get an economy of scale that is reached without actually standardizing the building or the end product. So you are standardizing the subassembly, but you are not standardizing the actual building. You don't repeat the building, you repeat the modules that go into the building. A product platform as a collection of modules that are common to several products. This, is, this commonality is developed intentionally to achieve a desired effect in order to create value. So a product platform could be understood as a game with finite but flexible set of playing pieces like Legos or dominoes. Product platforms are not products like a HUD code or manufactured home. Modularization is not productization. We're hearing a lot of architects saying this word and manufacturers is we're trying to productize construction. We're actually not in favor of that. We believe that a modularization approach, a, 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 a modularization approach that does not lead to a single product or a single building project, but rather a subassembly logic that can be continuously improved as a system with digital assets and manufacturing prowess that serves many different variant outputs is the desire. Product platforms are not products or prototypes. Product platforms enable economies of scale, not because of standardization at the product level or the building level, but because of standardization at the module level to allow more variety at the building level. An example outside of architecture would be, for example, the iPhone. So here in the iPhone, a modularized product platform, uh, various elements that come together are then manufactured, linked into a supply chain, multiple suppliers. There's actually three major suppliers for Apple assembled in California, uh, snapped together in California, and then sold at the store or through various retailers and online. What that leads to is over time, users giving Apple their input directly on your phone as you use it, as well as through surveys and other user groups, and an improvement from you know, 2007 all the way to today, every year, continual improvement of that product. And the base platform stays the same uh, as it evolves um, relatively as a concept, and then evolves and changes over time and continuously improves. Another example we like to use is the automobile industry. Most recently, the MEB product platform is the platform by which Volkswagen, um, Audi, that uh, conglomerate, uh, developed a, a, a uh, electrical car platform. That is the chassis with the battery pack. So you've got the axles, the powertrain, and the battery pack as a fundamental product platform. And then that could service a family of electrical vehicles. So all of these electrical vehicle brands you see, VW, Audi, Cert, Skoda, all use the same base product platform for those, those uh, different, different cars. It's, could slightly change in dimension, but the fundamental elements and how they link together and are connected are the same. Interestingly enough, Ford did not go out and develop its own product platform for this electric car chassis. It is like it licenses Volkswagen's product platform. It's that good. So this is kind of a new day for car manufacturers in which they don't necessarily own all their IP. They license different technologies from one another in order to create the right combination of elements. Interesting idea for what could potentially be the future of uh, the building industry. Offsite construction from project to product. So at the top, what you see here is a decoupling point between the product platform and the customer. So on the top is standard construction. Uh, each project is, is, is built as a bespoke custom project by an architect and, and, and designers to codes and standards. So it's very detailed and then uh, built. And so this includes the blue area, which is a high degree of customer interaction and customer inputs. At the bottom would be a product, which you have very little customer inputs. Um, you have a product approach, and that would be like a car or you know, a standard manufactured car or a HUD code home. 
Uh, what we're talking about here is something right in the middle, which is how do you create a system that could have a combination of parts or reconfiguring of parts to create different outputs? So product platforms balance standardization and customization. So this could be a new role for the architect, not to design at the top every single project as a bespoke project, but rather to think about this as a product platform design, you investing time with a project team or a developer or on your own to, to uh, create a system that could be adapted to many different sites. So those customer inputs and standard construction or detailed design are high, you, you as an architect provide a, a service, we provide services uh, with the client and there's a high degree of touch there with all the stakeholders and that's your role, that's the value you create for a project. In a different approach here at the bottom in a product approach, what you have is you get customer inputs and have that high degree of interaction before and after the project. And during the project, it is optimization time. It's productivity time because that's where we burn the most amount of uh, money and, uh, and effort. And so here in standard products, you actually are getting customer inputs, say for a smartphone, uh, you know, after the product is produced or before it's produced, not while the thing is actually being made, which is how we do it in construction. So that's a manufacturer's mindset, very different way to think about design. We're going to present today four models of what we call the new role of the designer in this landscape of modularized product platforms. One's called the variable manufacturer model. The other is the design designer and uh, designer slash client model or and client model, the designer and manufacturer model, and the designer and builder. And in all of these, we are proposing that a product platform is used to deliver the housing solution. So we'll give examples of each of these and that are currently in uh, as innovative models in the industry. And then Tyler Schmetter, my, my partner, is going to talk about how it works in a business model he developed uh, as a developer working with architects. All of these are modular team approaches. Uh, and here, you as the architect sit uh, as the red dot and the team comes together but, uh, and you have a standard developer and builder and architect that all work together and develop that product platform together. So the designer, the developer, and the general contractor work together to develop that, that product platform system, but the manufacturer sits on the outside and there might be multiple manufacturers that produce the product. An example of this would be Joe Tanny uh, at Resolution 4 Architects in New York City. Uh, he has a system called the Modern Modular, has been developed over about 20, 25 years for single family dwellings all over the country. Uh, these are the projects that he's developed. And what he essentially is using is a development of a product platform uh, with uh, that he, he kind of owns as the architect and continued to hone in um, and refine and continuously improve, but then works with multiple manufacturers to realize, um, uh, realize these boxes that are then shipped to site. Um, he uses a, a high degree of interaction with the client and is the touch point for the client, but is uh, not necessarily explaining the system to the client, but un understands the logics of manufacture that could be applied to various projects. Here's his modules of communal, communal use, modules of private use, and accessory modules that are put together in different combinations. So these are this, these are the product platform or the, the types. Uh, they can be adapted slightly that go together to create different configurations for different housing outputs. This is a different approach. This is the designer as manufacturer uh, in which they are combined as one entity and they work with a general contractor or builder to develop a product platform. And then the clients come to them for almost like a turnkey approach to delivering that, that project. So an example of this would be Connect Homes in uh, Los Angeles, uh, who, you, who uh, um, designs and manufactures as architects and manufacturers, single family ADUs and also homeless housing using the same product platform across these different typologies. So you have something that's very affordable and also something that's high end, but he uses the, the same product platform to service those projects. So here's an example of some of their product platforms and how they're developed. This uses a hot rolled steel frame with a light wood frame infill. And uh, this is their factory as, it's, as it got up and going. Um, it's it's uh, not an uh, automated factory. It's very much an analog hands-on, but it, it uses a steel chassis from a third-party uh, supplier. 
Another example would be the client and designer as one entity working with the manufacturer and the, uh, and, and the general contractor underneath a product platform. But all of those together are developing that product platform and delivering that product platform. One manufacturer, one general contractor, one client designer. An example of this would be a company we're all aware of, uh, Katera. Um, Katera did some things wrong, we know, they, they closed, but there's a lot of things they did right. Um, and I'd point to Craig Curtis, who's up at Methune now, who is the, the head architect uh, at Katera to develop these systems for two, three-story woody walk-ups, which is a very sophisticated product platform uh, deliver, delivered, uh, uh, developed to be delivered across multiple projects. Uh, they also had a modularized product platform for all of their various offerings that were white label, uh, kitchen sinks, toilets, uh, finishes, um, all uh, sort of owned by Katera, developed by Katera and manufactured overseas or in the United States. Uh, here's an example of a productized, uh, modularized product platform for a, a wet wall that goes within uh, the, the uh, um, apartment, uh, garden apartments. And so the wet wall inclu includes all the plumbing that would be needed to service on one side of the kitchen, on the other side of the bathroom. So you can see it being developed in a 3D software and then manufactured here on the factory floor. Um, they monitored their job sites, which I thought was uh, pretty incredible, so they could see what the um, uh, man hours that were be, being used on each project and uh, measure productivity and optimization. Another one would be vertical integration, which is a modular team approach um, as well. In this, in this sense, the client approaches the manufacturer, builder, and designer that really um, uh, work together to develop that product platform. And in this way, they're really all the same thing. Um, Katera had different units. Uh, that work together. But in this case, these are all just one company working under an umbrella. So you as an architect are in this essence are working uh, within a, a conglomerate company. And the example we like to use here that's coming overseas, uh, and it, but is very sophisticated abroad in both Sweden and Japan uh, is the development of modularized product platforms at Sekisui Heim. This is a factory in uh, just outside of Tokyo, and uh, they develop single, two-family, and multi-family low-rise all on the same product platform. Uh, here on the left is the slow line that includes um, uh, bathrooms and kitchens, and on the right uh, is the uh, fast line, um, and, uh, we're taught, and they uh, produce a box every three minutes that goes out of this factory. This is the closest to car manufacturing and uh, housing that we have seen internationally. Uh, Sekisui's uh, product platform uh, is a light gauge steel with hot rolled steel corners. Uh, those are robotically put together. Um, they also have a product platform for a different factory that uses light wood frame. Um, <clears throat> and then the ceramic cladding uh, goes on the outside um, as well. Uh, the bathrooms and kitchens are sort of put in as, as uh, modules within modules or boxes within boxes. Uh, it goes in uh, one product platform services all these different um, projects, you can see. Uh, in this case, Sekisui Heim uses architects or has architects that work for them, and they are the interface with the client, and they use a smart uh, um, uh, a, a platform, a digital platform to design uh, these housing solutions. Um, and uh, so they get a, a very personal hands-on approach. And then that's all tied into a, a computer system that um, understands what can or cannot be done uh, within the parameters of that product platform. Uh, this is uh, on the job site. We were there for their lightwood frame system, uh, one of the boxes coming out. You'll note, interestingly, in Japan and Sweden, uh, the boxes are smaller than here in the United States. They have a different philosophy about it, which is the smaller the boxes, the more variation you can get in the end building or project, uh, versus in the U.S., we tend to want to manufacture the largest box possible and ship it down the road. It's a very different uh, sort of approach to, uh, to design and construction using offsite. Uh, interestingly, Sekisui over time has matured. They've been around for 40, 50 years. And uh, what they've developed is really uh, a number of uh, sister or child companies. Uh, they have a steel mill that's a partner. They own their, uh, uh, they have a chassis plant. They have a facade plant that produces the cladding and that gets shipped to another factory. And then the final factory you saw is a dry fit assembly. There's no wet processes that happen there. And that's in order to increase the productivity and produce a box every three minutes. 
<clears throat> and then they have a partner that is Bathroom Pod. So really what they've developed is not a vertically, uh, a vertically integrated company, but in, in many ways has now outsourced a lot of those supply uh, uh, sub-assemblies that come to the factory in our assembly. Uh, we see a company that's trying to do a similar thing here in the United States and is emerging, which is volumetric building companies. Uh, they have a factory, uh, two factories on the East Coast and one in California. They bought the Katerra assets in, in Tracy, and uh, they are very much using a vertically integrated model. This is Sarah Ann Logan here um, sitting next to uh, her colleague, and she is VP of design. She is an architect and um, uh, trying to develop modularized product platforms that can serve us across all of their different projects uh, that come through the door. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Tyler, who's going to describe um, uh, this last model for designer, developer, builder, modular team, and a case study related therein. Uh, and then I'll finish up. Go ahead, Tyler. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, as Ryan uh, presented earlier, this modular team approach concept is, uh, is something that we at ModX consider very important uh, conceptually when, when uh, designing uh, into projects, when planning uh, uh, various projects, uh, as well as forming businesses. What we wanted to do here was uh, uh, share a, a, a product platform approach that was developed uh, nearly 20 years ago by incorporating uh, designer, developer, builder components, elements into the business structure itself, and then utilizing a variable manufacturer approach up and down the entire Eastern seaboard of the United States. Uh, next. So the modular team approach concept is, is important to understand which party is responsible for what scope, where, when, and how. And it's essential for the designer and architect to understand all of the, all of the, the components that are, that, are, that are before you, uh, the core components that are in the, in the black circles um, and, and, and how they align both in terms of interests and, and value um, and how they interrelate to the client and, and also the extended mind of the team. Uh, people uh, and teams uh, that, that we're talking about here at the bottom, the finance uh, as it relates to the project, insurance components, um, energy uh, performance uh, characteristics and the raters that are involved with uh, uh, inspecting and verifying, uh, transportation crews, what their, what their roles and responsibilities are and when and where they're supposed to be, uh, and the set crew with respect to delivering and handling the logistics on, on site with respect to uh, the various components, whether it's volumetric modular or, or panelization. Um, and then there's the sales aspect as well. There, there's there's a, a realtor or a sales channel of some sort that needs to be figured as well. So this is sort of a macro 50,000 foot view that allows uh, the architect designer or anybody for that matter to understand where everybody fits together and, um, and, and understand uh, their various roles and responsibilities. So, this was a, a, a company that was started uh, nearly 20 years ago in the early 2000s uh, called New World Home, and its fundamental constructs were to incorporate um, uh, traditional architecture with uh, high performance uh, characteristics, um, high performance characteristics in building science uh, and offsite construction. And those were the founding constructs of, of, of the company. And uh, it, Early on, we partnered with uh, USGBC um, and uh, various uh, NHB, Earthcraft, Energy Star, Air Plus, Indoor Air Plus, uh, EPA programs, and, and eventually evolved into Passive House as Passive House has become more pro, uh, prevalent in, in the United States. And the outcome of this approach, um, we really wanted to show the industry and the market, more importantly, as importantly, uh, or more importantly, what this system was capable of, what this um, what offsite construction prefab architecture uh, uh, could produce. And what you're looking at there on the right are uh, the first lead platinum single family uh, factory built homes in their respective states and regions. It's uh, first in New York, in New Jersey, in Georgia, and various uh, locales as well. And these were done, uh, you know, 2009, 2010. 
and they were the first projects of their kind to uh, attain the LEED Platinum certification without relying on any form of energy renewables. And that was something we thought was really important because we wanted to put the emphasis on the performance of the home and less so on, uh, at the time, the exotic uh, renewable energy technologies. Although we did uh, quite a bit of geothermal systems, we were able to attain these results just with relying on the native offsite construction techniques. Uh, next one. So what we did first and foremost was to develop a modularized prefab product platform. And what, what that meant was we would start with our architecture and our founding constructs, but develop a system that would be able to leverage the existing capacity of the uh, uh, volumetric modular industry on the Eastern seaboard. Uh, what we wanted to do was uh, not, not push the envelope too hard, but push it hard enough where we were able to accomplish uh, the, the metrics and um, uh, uh, the performance criteria, but also make it where it was saleable and profitable and where we could build these homes uh, 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 on a regular basis and provide them as economically as possible to the various markets in which we were penetrating. And so we started in the 3D world and rendering as, as everyone here understands with floor plans and elevations and attracted um, various uh, constituents to the, to the platform and then uh, eventually evolved that platform to be able to um, work with our various manufacturing partners. There was over two dozen at the time. This was this was pre Great Recession, and and we were able to leverage their existing product platform, their their existing production lines um, to to produce these uh, uh, produce these homes. Uh, next slide. And basically developing in house with our own team of architects that we uh, spent. Uh, a couple of years training and um, together learning uh, how to maximize uh, the capacity of these factories and the, the production line and the carrier trans the, the carrier uh, transportation limitations and um, still still provide a custom or semi custom experience for our homeowners and uh, ended up developing a, a system and approach that was was very um, predictable, um, very easy to uh, to price and and flexible enough where we could customize uh, the specifications and floor plans. In this instance here, you're looking at a standard floor plan that was semi customized to allow a uh, a, a developer in uh, in the Hamptons and East Hamptons to to customize the home to to a particular high end rental market um, and, and hit his hit his business model that would support. This is the first home that ended up turning into a portfolio of homes for this particular um, uh, this particular developer out in in, in the Hamptons. Uh, next, these are some of the elevations that came out of that particular project. And you obviously take the uh, the floor plans, the elevations, and you key them onto the um, the, the site plan. And the, as as the as the designer, you're you're handling all of these um, these components. This is nothing new except for that it's it's synced up to the production line uh, facility and what they're capable of producing. And that's that's really sort of key. Also, uh, as part of our model was to be very clear about uh, the, the project performance objectives up front. And in this case, this was uh, quite, a, quite a while ago, but we were uh, coming in at a, a 46 hertz rating, again, without any form of energy renewables. Um, we had it down into the 20s, um, so uh, but uh, budget limitations, we had to set that accordingly. But we've never, this particular, um, this company never produced a home with a HERS rating greater than 50 and um, all the way down to passive house level uh, performance. So nearly net zero and, and then uh, net zero with um, some form of energy renewables on top, not a problem at all coming out of the factory. So effectively these homes were, lead gold out of the factory uh, with some tweaking, lead platinum, not a problem. And eventually passive house as well. We ended up developing a proprietary set of project specification standards for this particular portfo portfolio that, it, this is really sort of the art and science of working with a uh, your manufacturing partner base and understanding their supply chain. And also pushing the envelope 
uh, literally and, and figuratively with respect to the supply chain and bringing in new ideas and new building science techniques and new products that would work with your product and working with your, your factory partners to, to allow them to understand why you're trying to do this and to do it in a way that is less that is not so disruptive or, or cost prohibitive. And over time, we developed uh, the, the ability to have a uh, fairly flexible uh, product specification standard that we were then able to articulate to the market uh, in, a, in a clear and effective manner and still allowed a, a very large degree of uh, flexibility in terms of customization and performance. Product selections as well, of course, uh, but to make it clear that this is a turnkey offering uh, that you could market uh, from Maine all the way down to, to Florida, and you could customize the plans, um, the facades, the elevations, uh, the product selections, uh, based on that, based on the uh, uh, the area uh, that you were marketing to, based on uh, the cost structure of a particular project, based on the, um, the the design attributes of a particular area, and this this flexibility of the system would allow us to do that, and uh, ultimately did. Most importantly, with respect to um, aligning what is happening in from, from design inception through the factory and onto the site is uh, essential to have the project site scope of work. It's all about these scopes of work. And the first several projects that, 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 that I developed, there was a scope of work for the site that was two or three pages long. That eventually evolved into 12, 13, 14 pages long as we understood the nuances of what was going on uh, on the site and who was responsible for what, when, and where, and tightening that up every time with a continual improvement layer that every single, after every single project, we would do a, uh, a debrief on it and we would, we would bring in all lessons, lessons learned and, and wrap them through the, uh, the scopes of work so that we can tighten them up and tighten them up because when you have, uh, when you have a manufacturer that uh, in, in this country, it, it is part of the challenge, you have a manufacturer who, who is typically not vertically integrated into the field to handle the, the, the scope of work uh, at the site. And so you have these disparate entities and that's the modular team concept is that these disparate entities had to be brought together at the table at inception and throughout the project with very clear communication, with very clear expectations about who's performing what scope of work, when and where uh, and, and, uh, and for how much. And that, that, is, that is very important because you, you you were able to get ahead of um, uh, of disputes and conflict resolution is uh, much much easier to handle if there is when and if there's an issue or challenge on site we know exactly who's responsible for what. This is a this is part of the the translation. So when when our designers in house in you know within our company we're we're working with a client and designing uh, uh, in 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 AutoCAD or whatever system we were using at the time, typically AutoCAD, we would then have to work with our factory partners because uh, all the factories have their own set of uh, software that they're working with. And so there is a conversion process that can be painful, but there's a learning curve in involved with it, with flattening out that learning curve. And they have to convert uh, whatever outside drawing sets there are into their factory production sets. And, and uh, we want to be able to do that as seamlessly as possible. So there is a learning curve there, but we were able to develop a way of communicating with our factories to the point where they were able to take our in-house plans and basically just feed them onto their line. And that, that, took a, that took a couple of years to figure out. But once we figured that out, uh, the designer iterations uh, uh, diminished considerably and we were able to, uh, to crank through uh, many more many more plans and, and, and without with less changes, less change orders and less issues down, down the road. So we have our plans, they're translated into factory production plans, they're stamped, they're sealed for permit set, whatever's, whatever's happening on site in terms of site details, um, they have to be stamped if there's a, a portico or a, a, a covered porch or a, a garage that's that's detached, that's not part of the, the structure, that would have to be stamped by a third-party architect or engineer. 
And then um, after the house is, is manufactured, there's typically a quote unquote as built set where there should be very little um, variation. Uh, sometimes there is, and, and it's essential to get that as built set in the hands of the set crew so they understand uh, what, if, if anything, had changed as the house, as the modules were progressing down the line. In addition to that, this system that we developed at New World was uh, uh, entirely offsite, including the foundation system. This 95% uh, plus of all the homes, there were some instances where uh, either a homeowner or a developer insisted on a port foundation, typically because of topography or, or, or other issues. But 95% um, of, the, of the homes here uh, that, that this, this company addressed were, were integrated with a superior wall, prefabricated panelized foundation system, uh, which is manufactured off site. Uh, it's it's, it's pre-insulated, um, there, there's less, concrete involved with it. They're very strong, they're very rigid, they're very precise, and it's a very seamless, um, very cool system, and it's very predictable. And when you're working with a predictable system and suddenly you're on site with an unpredictable concrete pour uh, with, a, with a, an imprecise foundation, that can lead to all kinds of problems. And so this was one way for us to, to get ahead of that uh, and, and to, to mitigate those potential issues with predictability. That is really what it's about. And it's extending that predictability of that industrialization approach into uh, the site as much as possible. And this foundation allowed us to do exactly that. Then the bottom there, you can see what it looks like when you're setting that. We have uh, a whole presentation on just this system and uh, how it's trans transported. The, they're transported actually vertically like that, but um, uh, they're delivered and set um, in uh, less than six hours for a uh, a typical single family house, anywhere between 1,500, 3,000 plus square feet. It goes very, very fast. And then what that allows you to do is take delivery of your modules that, that much faster. So speed is key uh, from a development perspective, uh, of course. We just wanna, to, with whatever time we have left here, just walk you through um, uh, an actual line production. This is uh, uh, the birth of a, of, a, of a 3D volumetric modular project. Um, you can see in this particular factory coming out of um, central, central PA, uh, Eastern PA and Central PA, a very, uh, it's a very modular friendly state. Much of the Northeast is, is centralized in that state. And this, this particular system um, was, uh, they, they would cut the floors first uh, and then they had a separate line for the, for the walls. And uh, they would they would swing the wall the inner walls in um, and set them and and then swing the outer walls on, and and then once the walls were uh, started to form they would go in with uh, some plumbing and some electrical as well, and uh, that's what this is here. These are the beginning the beginning the beginning of a line there. If you look at the top right, you can see a um, there's a floor cut right there. So that is literally the beginning of a module, and then this is the next station. There are different uh, production line techniques. This this one, um, they would roll it down with with power jacks um, and and just move the line uh, accordingly that way. Uh, as as the as the line progresses, the walls. The, uh, there are different techniques, but most of them are like this, where they will insulate from the outside in. There are factories that will do it the other way around for various for various reasons. But what's nice about this technique is that. It's precise. It's it's you're able to to cut your insulation uh, and and get it installed. Very nice, very neat. No air gaps. Grade one install, and it's 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 third party inspected, third party verified. If you're going for a lead certification, or if you're going for a passive house certification, you're able to do that very easily, either on site or through um, uh, uh, photos or video. Very easy to do. So this is the house going down the line. This is an interesting part in the process. Uh, there are a couple of different roof techniques, roofing techniques. Um, there are roof caps, which is a, just a, you know, the form of the roof that is dropped on top. Uh, very nice, um, very expensive uh, because that has to be transported on a separate carrier. Uh, but architecturally, sometimes it's necessary. Performance-wise, sometimes it's necessary. Most of the time for these 3D uh, volumetric modulars coming out of Pennsylvania, you'll have a hinge roof. And that's what you're looking at here where they, uh, it's actually built flat and then um, they, they erect it and they, they flip the panels. Uh, so they're able to flip them back down before they, they ship them. And uh, this, is, this is a point in the production line where they're called, the, where they're quote unquote proofing the house. 
they're bringing the modules together. And not all factories do this, but the ones, most of the ones I worked with did because of the, um, the, the quality and the performance objectives I was trying to get. It's, it's key. You don't want your first modules coming together for the first time out in the field. It, ideally, you put them together, uh, even if it's for just a few minutes to, 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 to verify uh, that everything is done uh, properly uh, on, on site, uh, at, uh, on the line as it goes. This is a top floor of, of a house that uh, was, was, being be, was being built on Eastern Long Island, uh, out in the Hamptons. And you can see they'll, they'll proof it and, and um, get, the, get the roofing uh, sheathing going. And uh, it's also very effective for training uh, and for bringing uh, architectural teams, uh, uh, designers, uh, set crews, um, set finishers, uh, homeowners, anybody to get them on uh, into the factory is essential because you can only see it or hear about it so much, but when you see it and you're able to walk through your top floor of your new home at a factory, it's a, it's it's a it's an existentially fulfilling experience for most. This is a, a, a module that's that's complete and ready for shipping, and uh, they shrink wrap it here in the United States, which is a problem from a sustainability perspective. We did our best um, to 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 incorporate the the shrink wrap into uh, recycling centers. Not an easy thing to do, and it is. Costly, uh, as Ryan was showing you earlier, in Japan, for instance, this is unheard of. They use reusable tarps. Europe and Japan, they just don't do stuff like this. And and hopefully, uh, our country will get a little bit smarter with respect to reusable tarps as well. Um, but they'll do that for weatherproofing. They'll also run a layer underneath in case uh, it, it, you'll get all kinds of road grime, uh, particularly in the winter, coming up underneath the the module. And then you utilize whatever open volume you have for ship loose. You see in the bottom left there, you've got various components like bathtubs that, that may not have been set, or um, in this case, you've got some chimneys, some faux chimneys, and some, um, some gable end uh, pieces as well. This is just to give you a quick sense of what um, you can get out of a 3D volumetric factory in terms of finish. Uh, you've got your, your trim, your, your casing, uh, your, your crown moldings, your windows are in and trimmed. Uh, you've got uh, primer, uh, sometimes full paint. You've got uh, coppered ceilings. We've got ERVs in. We've got, uh, obviously, the windows are in and, and, and uh, trimmed on both the interior and the exterior, ready for siding. In this case, there's no vinyl siding. If it was vinyl siding, it would be installed on the factory. This was a, a fiber cement siding uh, project, or if it's a cedar clapboard, that's going to be done on site. Uh, Level of finish in the kitchen. You can see counters are in, uh, countertops are on, backsplashes are in. Uh, you've got your 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 uh, stove venting in, uh, recessed lighting in. Uh, pretty high level of finish. Flooring is typically done on site. Uh, you can do it in the factory, but it's not something I would <laughs> personally advise. Most factories don't want to touch it because of the potential for damage, and you've got seam issues and whatnot. So it's really sort of the last thing you do on site once you've got your house set. And, and ready to roll. Uh, and this is what bathroom finish can look like. You can get tile work done. You can get vanities. You can get custom tile, uh, custom custom vanities brought in. If you can work with the supply chain procurement guys, typically a case of beer helps uh, with respect to getting um, <laughs> uh, custom vanities installed. But they will do it, and they, you know, it gives them a satisfaction and, and a source of pride when they start to see a home like this come through. It's not, uh, it's not, it's not every day, but it's becoming more commonplace to see homes like this coming through the line as well. So um, that's, ha that's happening. The, the modules are being shipped uh, a day or two before that happens. This is, the, this is the set that we were talking about for the superior walls. This is a three, four, five hour process where they come and they're craned in with a small crane, you know, 20, 30 ton crane. And uh, they're going into site really quickly and um, laser, laser leveled. Once that foundation is in, the, the modules are, um, are, are brought into the site. Uh, there's a whole bunch of site logistics and staging areas that has to be thought through. We can talk about that at a latter date. The modules are uh, brought in sequentially, um, you typically from uh, the first floor out towards the crane. Uh, and in this instance, cranes are 80 to 100 tons and they'll swing from the outside in. And this is the first floor going on and the beginning of the top floor. Swinging boxes, as we call it, it's, it's what we live for in this business. Um, and uh, here's here's a progression. You can see on the bottom uh, how a, how a box will uh, will swing into place. And these boxes are typically for a for a, for a market like the Hamptons, you will want to max out your 
production line spot, you will want to max out your carrier, uh, which can go up to 60 feet. So you're, that's what you're doing here with your volumes. You've got your roofs. If the roof has to be flipped, typically they'll, they'll flip it on uh, uh, the ground level, it's safer that way. Um, asphalt shingles can be installed uh, in the factory typically. Um, the seams uh, are done on site. Uh, anything more complex like a, a cedar shake or a metal roof is done on site. Uh, but you can see here that this is the completion of that set uh, and the sun is still up. So this was a, a single day set. There it is, one day, eight modules, weatherproofed, taped in, strapped, uh, 120 mile an hour wind zone set in um, less than a day, well, one day. And then once that happens, there's an immediate handover uh, where the on-site finished scope of work will begin to commence immediately, hopefully, if your uh, local GC builder partners are organized enough. And in this case, this was a siding, uh, uh, some trim and siding that had to be installed on site. A couple of site built details that I was talking about before, a covered porch there that just didn't make sense for us to do it in the factory. So we'll, 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 we'll site build that and there's a separate set of plans and sealed and a seal for that. And uh, a couple of weeks later, the house looks like that. And a couple of weeks after that, uh, months, if there, there are trade issues or supply uh, issues, this is what this house looks like, inside and out. Typically, 100 to 120 days to CO from the start of factory production for a, a home that looks like a 200-year-old, 150-year-old farmhouse that is up to a lead platinum level. It's fantastic, Tyler. Thank you very much. So, such a great overview. We're going to finish this up by saying um, we think the future of offsite uh, much like we see in Japan, is, is eventually going to take hold in the United States, which is a horizontal distribution, which means uh, here you could take on the role potentially as an architect, as a product platform designer that could engage with these multiple parties, but really lead this process if you so choose. Tyler did it as a developer, was the central figure and the cog in the wheel. Um, but as an architect, this could take place. And there's a couple of companies that are experimenting with this currently. One is Assembly OSM. This is a, a sort of sister company to Shop Architects in New York City. Uh, and they have developed a, a really a, a, an idea around uh, how one could create a product platform that could service many different projects, uh, but source all, all of the supply chain from third parties so that they uh, are essentially a dry fit operation. There's another one which is called Juno. Uh, BJ Siegel used to work for Apple. He's an architect. Uh, maybe have seen his presentations. The idea is develop a multi-family uh, platform, you know, using steel or mass timber in this case, uh, that all of it, again, is procured from third parties, but it's a smart product platform that's a dry fit assembly. So whether architects can do this or not is yet to be proven out, um, but there are a few experiments currently happening around the country. Finally, to develop a modularized platform, product platform, the role of the designer we think is in between both a say conventional bespoke project design at the top and at the bottom, you know, a productized approach. We think this role, the designer in combining parts and configuration is really the future of, 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 of in particular housing and industrialized housing. Uh, with that, I want to say that ModX is an advisory group. We also do ex knowledge exchanges, and we're going to be launching an EDU in the future, an education platform, where you could learn more as you learn today, but more in depth on various topics. Uh, we work throughout the world, uh, and uh, we're currently uh, doing a project for HUD, Housing and Urban Development, to develop a strategic plan uh, so that they can identify and uh, put their spending and their, their funding into strategic efforts for industrialized housing. And in one in particular is we're trying to revamp the regulatory framework in the U.S. So stay tuned for that and ModX's impact on uh, how offsite progresses uh, in the U.S.